All right, we should be live now. I'm just going to verify that we are live before we start. So uh, if people are coming in to watch, you should be able to see us from both the Gorgas House Museum and the Mildred Westerbelt Warner Transportation Museum's pages. I see it up on the Gorgas House Museum page and just verifying it on the transportation page. So, yep, it looks like we're both uh, available on both of those pages now. And uh, actually, I might need to uh, change the link uh, for people to join. I'll see if I can edit that really quickly. So good morning to everyone who is just joining us. Um, try to edit, see if... See if I can edit these posts to reflect the changes to the StreamYard link. All right, so I've done that on the, all right. If anybody has any questions about the Gorgas House Museum or the Transportation Museum, feel free to leave comments in the comment section. I'm just updating these posts here. We'll get started in a second. All right, so it looks like we're live on both pages. And let me make sure I've got all my sound off. Okay, well, uh, I guess we will go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I am the Communication Specialist for UA Museums. And joining me today for a discussion about history are Catherine Edge, Director of the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum and Brandon Thompson, Director of the Gorgas House Museum. Welcome to the live stream, Catherine and Brandon. Thank you so much. Hi. Yeah, thanks for having us. Well, uh, Catherine, I noticed that y'all brought a friend with you. Would you like to introduce him? Yes. So um, the guest we have with us today is Will Hawkins. Will is the executive director of the Tuscaloosa County Preservation Society and a former colleague of mine. So we're very excited to have Will with us. Thank you so much for, uh, for being with us today. Happy to be here. And thank y'all for having me. Well, uh, Will, thank Will seems like a, a good person to come on and talk about history with us. Uh, but in case you are joining the museums from your home live streams for the first time, uh, the reason we're doing this and the reason that we're on Facebook right now is because like many of you, UA Museum staff are at home due to COVID-19. The Alabama Museum of Natural History, the Gorgas House Museum, the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum, and the Jones Archaeological Museum at Moundville Archaeological Park have all had to close their doors. So we decided to bring the museums to you. And so while we are broadcasting, feel free to ask us any questions in the comments, or if you would like to join in on the live stream and, and actually uh, directly <laughs> talk to us through the video, you can click on the link in the description of the live stream. And it's very easy to do. You can do it through either a laptop or a desktop computer, and you can even do it through your smartphone. It's really easy to do, so you can, you can do it that way, or you can just drop a question or a comment in the comment section. And just as a reminder, this is live, so anything can happen. Uh, have a couple of these that we've done, my notifications have gone out. I've gotten text messages and things, so that can happen. This is all live. Uh, so just hang in with us in case uh, we have any issues or Facebook have any has any issues. Uh, websites are really trying their best to meet the needs of online activity during this time. So just bear with us uh, because this is live. Uh, so let's get to talk about uh, get to talking about history. That's the topic that we are going to address today. So Brandon, uh, let's start talking about the history of each of your museums. And so I think maybe we should start with the Gorgas House Museum. So what would you like to share with us about uh, what history looks like to the Gorgas House Museum? Uh, well, thank you. No, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, so like you talk, like you said, the, the main theme for this week is history. So really the, the question we want to try and answer, one of the three main questions we're going to talk about today is what does the history look like in your unit and what period of history does your museum or unit's um, content cover? So I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint real quick. Uh, I'm like I said, I'm going to try and keep this brief uh, because I could probably talk about this for a few hours. Uh, so I'll <laughs> try and keep it as brief as I can. Let me get to the slideshow. I'll go ahead and get it started. So let me know when that's up and I'll start the first slide. Yeah, you're ready to go. Everybody can see it. Okay. All right. Great. So what does history look like in your location? What about the Gorgas House? So the Gorgas House was built in 1829. Uh, it was 
designed and built as the student dining hall uh, for the campus, for the University of Alabama. Uh, it's the oldest building on campus. It was built two years before the university officially opened uh, in 1831. So it was originally built as a student dining hall. Uh, after the students became a little too ruckus and rowdy, they were kicked off campus in the 1840s. And since that time, it's been a variety of other things. Uh, it's been a post office, a hospital, a hotel, and a private residence a few among a few other uh, things. Uh, so that was really its original history. Um, so originally it went from its inception as a dining hall to the hotel, uh, then eventually to uh, the private residence for the Gorgas family when they got there in 1879. Um, so that's really kind of the, the history that we talked to really from its inception all the way through about the mid 1950s and all this different uh, periods of history that we talked about. But currently if you visit the museum, it's really presented as a narrative about 1880 to about 1910. And that's really the period of significance that the house speaks to. And that's predominantly the, the major Gorgas family's uh, occupation of the home. So Josiah Gorgas, who's the eighth president of the university, uh, that started in 1878. He suffered a stroke and then in 1879, he became the campus librarian and they allowed the family to move into the home. And that was in 1879. And then it really follows the history of the family through their occupation of the home really all the way into the mid 1950s. And it talks about not only Josiah's contributions to uh, the building and to the, the university, but also Amelia and her children, uh, especially talking about William, their son. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later, later on. But it has the potential to talk about a lot of other histories and we're starting to talk about that. So not only do we talk about the, the home's period of occupation and his contributions to the university and also the Gorgas family one, but we're also starting to explore some of the other histories on campus, specifically slavery, the roles of women on campus, and how were students using the space and really what their contributions were. And we'll touch on that a little bit more as we go on and start talking about it. But in short, it is really that 1829 to 1953 period of history with a laser focus in about 1880 to 1910 with histories generally expanding thereon, depending on what people are interested in reading about. Um, but yeah, that's, so that's a really brief and concise version of what the history is. So I gave you our hour and a half long tour in about three or four minutes, I think. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you have any questions, shoot them my way, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, the Gorgas House Museum has a lot of different areas that you could cover. Uh, that you, you mentioned uh, Civil War, uh, the University of Alabama, slavery, the Gorgas family, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of aspects that you could talk about with that. Um, so Catherine, so Catherine, what uh, what does uh, history look like with uh, the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum? Right. So the um, the Transportation Museum is um, it's the local history museum, and uh, what we aim to do is look at Tuscaloosa history through the lens of transportation. So um, how transportation? <clears throat> excuse me. Um, how am, uh, transportation impacted and affected the um, the history of Tuscaloosa as we know it? And so we start um, we start at the beginning by um, looking at the um, geological importance of where Tuscaloosa is located, and then we um, hit all the high points and really go all the way through time to uh, Tuscaloosa today. So, um, because my my building is uh, circular, if you um, if you're familiar with the Queen City Bathhouse, it is a historic building in town. Um, because it's circular, as you um, as you make the circle through the through the location, um, when you end back at the front doors, the idea is you've um, you've traveled through history and. And then whenever you re-enter the real world, um, you are viewing Tuscaloosa through um, through new eyes, through a new perspective, having um, having traveled through uh, traveled through time essentially at uh, at the transportation museum. So that's uh, that in a nutshell is uh, is what uh, what history looks like for for us. That's awesome. Yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, local Tuscaloosa history that I've learned uh, from, from visiting uh, the Mildred Westervelt Warner Transportation Museum that I didn't know. Uh, so I, I really appreciate that you all uh, have all of that history that's right there and that people uh, I've noticed when I've been a visitor at uh, the Warner Transportation Museum that local people will come in and say, hey, I remember when this uh, was there was a pool here and things like that. So it's almost like a uh, there's still history that's being added to it all the time. 
Yes. And uh, when we have those visitors that, that come in and say, oh, I, I swam here when I was younger, we I, I always say, welcome back. Building looks <laughs> a little different, but we're happy that you came back. And um, so that's always that's always nice when uh, when visitors visitors come in to experience the building as a museum, um, having their own experience uh, with it as the uh, the bathhouse when it was a, uh, a pool. So um, that's always that's always lovely to uh, to have. That's really, really cool. Uh, well, Brandon, let's go back to you and talk about um, the history of the the Gorgas House Museum. So, so what? How did how did the museum be? Or how did the house, I guess, become a museum? Okay, great question. So, let me bring up this slide for you real quick. Okay, uh, so how did the Gorgas House Museum form? Well, in the 1940s, when two of the daughters were still living in the home, uh, the University of Alabama, uh, the Gorgas Memorial Board. Uh, and really the state government, the state of Alabama, turned into a state shrine in the 1940s. I think it was 1944. I could be a little off on that, but it was in the 1940s when they did that. And then when the last daughters passed away in 1953, when they passed away about six months apart, uh, in the very next year, the home was turned into a museum. So since 1954 until the present time, it's been a museum in one way or another. And even in and even in the 1930s and 1940s, the daughters were starting to give people tours of the home. But it was really in 1954 that it was enshrined as a museum in honor of the Gorgas family. And that was an effort by the university and the state and uh, local women's groups, local women's organizations that really spearheaded that effort. So that started in 1954 is when it's been a museum. And, you know, its interpretation has changed a bit. Its interior structures changed. There have been a lot of renovations and different uh, narratives presented there. But uh, it really was a local effort by women's organizations, the university, and the state of Alabama to turn it into a museum in uh, the 1950s. Yeah, so you talked a little bit about the uh, the way in which the interpretation of the museum has changed. What would you say? Mm -hmm. What would you say those changes have been? Okay, so uh, originally it was really interpreted as the home for where the Gorgas has lived, and uh, it was really uh, the museum changed as uh, because you know people were living there, so it looked exactly like a home. Uh, but it has changed a bit. There have been a couple of different renovations uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, there was a paint analysis on the home, looking to see what the original paints were looking like, uh, what the interior structure of the home actually looked like. And at that point, they took down some really gaudy wallpaper, uh, and they re <laughs> repainted everything to be accurate to the 1890s. So if you visit the home now, all the interior colors are really accurate to that time period to go along with that narrative. So when you walk into it now, uh, you have to forgive me, I'm visualizing in my head, but space is really important when you talk about it. You walk into the to, to the home and you have a brief history on who the Gorkas family was, uh, what the home actually was, what it looked like originally. And when you start touring these different rooms, each one kind of goes along with that 1880 to 1910 uh, narrative. And that includes you know, a dining room, a sitting room, a post office. And when you walk upstairs, there's a parlor and a few other bedrooms as well. But trying to talk to some of the other histories, we have tiny little corners or niches that speak to the different histories. We have one that talks about the Civil War history with a couple of hands-on stations. Uh, upstairs, we have the piano that goes from you know, 1875 that's continuing to be used today. So there are lots of different histories. Uh, and we're trying to engage the student community as best we can to help really create content and drive what those histories and narratives might be. Uh, the most recent one I'll speak to uh, is a museum study student. He's also a PhD student in anthropology, getting his archaeological philosophy degree, uh, who did uh, an exhibit based on the 1999 archaeological excavations around the home. So that gives us a window into, I guess, Native American artifacts that were found on site that date back. Uh, 500 to 1,000 years ago, all the way into like the early 20th century, where you can see how the home was being used a little differently. Uh, but my favorite artifact that we that we found that we can talk about is this blue glass bead, and those are commonly found in slave assemblages when you do historic uh, plantation excavations. And had it checked out, I believe Elliot Blair, who was on the the podcast or the live stream yesterday, and it does predate. It does date to that time period, the antebellum time period. So we can say with you know 99% confidence that this was a slave bead that was found at the kitchen excavations behind the home uh, where the slaves actually lived and prepared food for the students. So it's one way to really expand and talk about all the numerous different histories that the space can speak to. 
and there's there's a lot. We're, we're doing a lot of work and trying to get as many students involved in doing that, but uh, there are a few, so stay tuned. Uh, we'll keep changing things a bit. Yeah, y'all do such a good job to incorporate the students to uh, have exhibits and participate in what's going on at the Gorgas House Museum. So that's awesome. Well, uh, Catherine, so uh, how did uh, Catherine? How did the um, the Transportation Museum go from a, a bathhouse to uh, becoming a museum? Well, it's um, it's a it's an interesting, slightly interesting story. Um, the the Queen City Bathhouse was built in um, its construction started in 1941. It opened in 1943, and uh, it was designed and built by uh, Don Buell Schuler, who is a very interesting character to our local history in his own right. Um, but the 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 entire project, the building, the pool, um, the entire property was commissioned by the Warner family to create a safe place for recreational swimming and instruction um, after the tragic loss of their eldest son, David. Um, so the reason that the pool exists is um, exists anyway is to make um, make a safe place for um, for those kinds of activities. Um, the pool closed in the 1980s, however, and uh, was filled in. So now we use it as green space. Um, but uh, and the building was uh, left vacant um, for a period of time until it was renovated to be the transportation museum. So this building, um, much like the kind of like the Battle Friedman House, has only really had two purposes. It has been the uh, the Queen City Queen City Bathhouse, and it's been the transportation museum. The Battle Friedman House has been. Um, a private residence and then it's been the location of uh, one of the locations of the preservation society so there hasn't been a lot of use of these historic buildings um to use them as examples um that deviates a lot from their original purpose which i think is is, is really interesting um but the museum opened on uh, december 13th 2011 uh, so we are the youngest museum within the the ua museums department um, but the history of the building and the overall property is very well established, and uh, it's a story that we are very excited and uh, privileged to share with the with the community. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty amazing. You, you, I, I think it's cool that we've got sort of the the oldest building on the University of Alabama campus represented here, and then we mm -hmm. also have the youngest. Uh, museum and the UA Museum's uh, family here uh, uh, talking to each other. So I think that's really cool to have that interaction. Um, Will, I want to bring you into the conversation now. So we've talked a little bit about the Gorgas House Museum and mm -hmm. we've talked a little bit about the Transportation Museum. So what are your thoughts? Like, uh, let, let's talk about the Gorgas House Museum first. What, what are your thoughts about the Gorgas House Museum and its history in, in terms of Tuscaloosa and, and beyond? Well, I really enjoy the Gorgas House Museum because it can speak to so many different uh, time periods in uh, Tuscaloosa's history, uh, from uh, the capital years all the way up uh, to the 1950s when it first became a fully functioning and running muse museum. Um, I love how they are encompassing more interpretations of uh, slavery that took place on campus, as well as the uh, roles uh, that women played on campus. Uh, they do a fantastic job of uh, sharing those stories uh, and actually bringing those stories to light that have been uh, left behind, for lack of a better description, for so many years beforehand. Um, one of the other aspects I enjoy about the Gorgas Museum uh, is the architectural style of it in that that home has been replicated through other different homes and offices around Tuscaloosa. So when you're driving through Tuscaloosa, it's easily it's easy to drive by a place and goes, oh, that looks just like the Gorgas House. Well, that's because the architect blatantly stole that <laughs> style, that, that facade of that house and put it onto a brand new building. So it's sort of like it's you got little mini Gorgas' houses around town as well, which I find really amusing <laughs> and fascinating at the same time. That's really, really cool. I've, I've never noticed that. Now I'm going to be looking for that when I drive around Tuscaloosa. Mm -hmm. I'll have to I'll have to see if I can spot any copycats. Uh, well, in terms of the Transportation Museum, what, what are your thoughts on on that and how uh, the architecture of that building and how they tell the story of Tuscaloosa? Well, I like the uh, the Transportation Museum. It's a, it's a wonderful uh, modern take on uh, architecture, sort of an Art Deco type of style. Uh, and the uh, exhibit on the inside, uh, as you walk around the circle, it's sort of like walking through Tuscaloosa's history. Uh, from uh, transportation on the Warrior River to the trolley lines to the interstate coming to Tuscaloosa to all of it. And all of that really encompasses the history of Tuscaloosa. We're really a transportation-based uh, city from, from the very beginning, which is the reason why we got the state capitol here 
uh, in the 19th century was because we were essentially the northernmost port on the navigable, navigable uh, river system in the state. Uh, and we were in the dead middle. So what a perfect place to have a capital. Uh, so <laughs> the uh, Transportation Museum really illustrates that point uh, that Tuscaloosa is a transportation city. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so uh, I guess we could um, talk more about the history of, uh, with the, well, the preservation of these museums because uh, the Gorgas House Museum has been around for such a long time. And uh, the Transportation Museum, even though it's only been a museum for a short amount of time, it has been in Tuscaloosa for a while. Um, before we get to that, I just wanna mention if you have any questions for Brandon or Catherine or Will, feel free to uh, drop a question in the comment section. and. Uh, we'll, we will do our best to answer them. So uh, feel free to do that at any point uh, during our conversation here. So Brandon, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the, the reasons why it's important to preserve the history of the Gorgas House. Why, why does it matter that this, that this house on the, the campus of the University of Alabama, uh, why is it important to keep it around and make sure that people know about it? Uh, that's a great question, and, and Will kind of touched on a little bit too. Uh, and I'll kind of go where I'll go, kind of build up what some of what Will was saying. So the university's history starts at the Gorgas House. It is the only place on the university's campus where you can come and get a window into the university's entire history. Uh, that starts with its inception. It's antebellum um, uh, history. It's participation in slavery. It's rolled in the Civil War and then Reconstruction the Industrial Revolution, all the way through the mid 20th century <laughs> and into the Civil Rights era. So it's really the only place you can come and get that glimpse, that window into the university's entire narrative. And then it speaks to the Gorgas family and their contributions um, to really what to, not only to the university, but to the state, but also to the nation and then international contributions when you start talking about William. So you know Josiah, he's the university president, but he's also a Confederate general. And what does that mean to have a historic space that has that type of association with history? And how do you interpret that? And how do you talk about it? Because it is a cultural resource, it belongs to everyone. And everyone has a right and something meaningful to say about how the space speaks to them and what it should say. And then Amelia, she was campus librarian. She was the nurse matron. She was the postmistress. She talks about the changing roles of women uh, during her time period and really how she established what those roles were going to be on the university's campus. You know, the library, when they built it in 1939, they named it after her. And it was the first building on campus named after uh, a woman. And there've been, I think about 12 others since then. I have the list around here someplace. I can look it up for you. And then they had six children and they all made individual contributions to the university in their own way. But really their oldest son, William, has the most long lasting and international fame for what his contributions were. And the long and short of it, you know, he, he was in the military, he studied medicine and sanitation, and his major contribution was eliminating yellow fever and malaria in the Panama Canal Zone and getting the thing completed. And we have his ties to the home. This is a picture of him with his mother in front of the home around 1910. And what his contributions were, not only to the university and to the nation, but also his international contributions. So he was pretty, pretty influential. So, you know, moving on to some of the other things we're talking about, kind of getting away from that, you know, mid 20th century interpretation of the space. There's many of the other unspoken histories that we can talk to. And, you know, the most salient ones are slavery uh, that really haven't been spoken to. There's been a lot of movement recently to kind of talk about these, these histories, not necessarily from a social justice theme, but really more hey, these are things that exist. They made, These people make contributions. Let's tell their stories as well and get them as part of the, this part of the overarching narrative of the space. Then we can also get glimpses into earlier life ways. There's, there's a well behind the home um, that uh, when I've done excavations in the past, you can actually excavate wells and they're treasure troves of history uh, because when they're done, people toss everything into them. And when I'm giving the tour, I jokingly state, that the other thing that's behind this house someplace are the remains of Gorgas family and slave privies, which are really just you know bathrooms or restrooms. And excavating some of those, they're even better treasure troves of history, really for two reasons. Uh, one, whatever falls in there, you're not going to go in after. And two, what it falls into <laughs> is really soft and squishy, so it preserves everything really, really well. So the potential of doing further archaeological work in the future to really help us fine tune and expand the narrative you're talking about really exist. And then the, the other reason it's important to preserve these types of physical landmarks like the Gorgas family 
is that they can be active and contributing parts of campus life and the city's life. I tell students all the time when they come in, I don't want you to see this space as this cold, distant, old building that you don't even know you want to come into. I tell them to look at it as an active and contributing member of their campus life. Uh, whenever students come in, I always ask them, you know, what is your major? Uh, because I try and fine tune the tour to really fit into things that they are interested in. And then they can turn the space into something that fits their campus life and really make allow them to create their own meaning for what the space means to them. Because I can tell them all the history and all the facts and riddle off all these dates uh, for, in, for in perpetuity. I could do that for hours. But really finding that one piece of history or that one object or that one part of the architecture that speaks to them what they're interested in helps create an anchoring and cementing space for their experiences on campus. That's something they can always come back to. Uh, so the long and short, it's really, uh, it has historic significance because we've determined that it has architectural significance and uh, significance of who the people were contributing to the space. But it's also important because we can continue to create our own meaning for what these historic spaces mean. And a lot of the efforts we've been doing that really speaks to students because there are 38,000 of them. But anybody who has access to the space can create and really make their own significance of it. And that's something we're trying to continue on. Yeah, I hope students uh, take advantage of making the Gorgas House Museum sort of their space, because that's one of the things that I did not take advantage of when I was a student at the University of Alabama. And I wish I had been able to uh, just go read a book on the outs, you know, yeah. on the balcony in the rocking chair. That that would be pretty cool to do for an afternoon. So um, thank you for taking us through that. So, Catherine, for for your purposes with the Transportation Museum, why do you think it's important to preserve the history that, that you all talk about? Well, um, because we we focus more on you know, general general Tuscaloosa history, like that is that that's what we we discuss. We try to hit we try to hit all the all the high points um, to create as um, holistic approach to uh, Tuscaloosa history as we can. Um, it's interesting and important to preserve not just the building um, because one of the things that I I ask. Um, groups, uh, particularly school groups, whenever they come through is, do you know of another building in town that looks anything like this? And a couple of them um, make a reference to the stadium and that it's it's large and circular and concrete and they're um, they're not wrong. Um, but, uh, you know, that's that's really kind of the uh, the the comparison pretty much stops there. And so I, I try to get our uh, younger members of the community to, you know, to just think about the building that they're they're physically in and, and be present in that way but um but really the i mean the best way to learn about the place you live whether it's over a lifetime or for four to six years as a college student is to know the local history of of that area of that town um it's the story of the town and tuscaloosa has such a very interesting and varied history that needs to be preserved as the foundation and um you know, whenever you have that foundation, foundational knowledge of uh, the town, it just builds a it builds a stronger community. And um, the the preservation society does a a really great job uh, with that outside of the uh, the university with the properties they maintain, um, because so many of them, uh, so many of their properties touch on a different. Uh, particular time period of, of Tuscaloosa history, which is which is also really really interesting. So, it's it's important to know where you come from, and um, again, whether it's over a lifetime or just for a couple of years as a student, um, it it creates a better sense of place and a stronger sense of community, and that's something that I think we all need to to really really work for and uh, strive to as we move forward. Will, what do you think about that question in, in terms of why it's important to preserve places like the Gorgas House Museum, like the Transportation Museum, and those sort of local uh, landmarks uh, like uh, Catherine was talking about? Why do you think that's important to pr preserve those things? Our places um, for any town, any community is, is the story of that place. And without that story and that history, you're not going to have any direction of where you want to move to in the future. Uh, whether that story is good, bad, or imperfect, um, we all, every single person has a home where you go home, whether it's to mama, to daddy, 
to whoever. Uh, if you grew up here in Tuscaloosa or if you're here just, just as a student for that four years or for that lifetime, Tuscaloosa is that home. Uh, and we like for our home to be there when we go back there. Uh, and that home tells our story uh, from the earliest of Tuscaloosa settlers uh, through through today. Every, every day is a moment in time, a moment in history uh, that we need to take advantage of, uh, try to record and try to learn from it. And by preserving these historic buildings and sites is just one way that we can all do that together. Uh, each building tells a story uh, for different segments of the population and different levels and different meanings. Uh, so to save as many as we can and to protect as many as we can is, is a very important uh, aspect of community. And one oh, thing I'd oh, like sorry. to add is um, all because we are, the, the three of us are very fortunate to um, have such a close association with a, such a variety of historic locations in town, um, they, they're tangible evidence of the past, whatever that um, portion of the past may be that is either um, directly interpreted or can be interpreted by visitors. So our, our historic places are uh, they're they're tangible they're tangible evidence of the past and um, by maintaining that we then um, we maintain that link to who we were and it just helps us it helps us as we move forward and I guess uh, uh, maybe Catherine if you want to speak to the fact that we uh, that Tuscaloosa just celebrated a big milestone in its history do, do you want to talk about uh, the preservation of that history and how we've we've also uh, buried something at Manderson Landing to uh, <laughs> to uh, be opened in the future so that other people from you know uh, the next generation will be able to see the history that that we're sort of living in right now do you, do you want to speak to that uh, yes so um in uh, if if you haven't been aware over the last year, twenty nineteen <laughs> was the uh, bicentennial for the city of Tuscaloosa. Um, it was also the bicentennial for the state of Alabama, and um, we didn't celebrate quite as long as the state did. Uh, we focused our um, our activities within the the calendar year twenty nineteen. Um, but it's interesting to note that uh, Tuscaloosa is one day older than the state of Alabama. And uh, Tuscaloosa was made the county seat the day before uh, Alabama was um, a formally and officially welcomed into the union. And uh, so we we carry that that distinction and that we're we're one day older than the state. Um, so our personal local bicentennial um, carried significance from uh, from that that perspective. Um, but yes, there was a time capsule that was put together that was intended to capture what life looked like in Tuscaloosa in the year 2019. And I was fortunate to, uh, to work on the committee that um, through a variety of discussions, um, we think uh, <laughs> narrowed, narrowed down and created um, a, a very good picture of what Tuscaloosa uh, looks like and uh, looked like in 2019. And uh, that time capsule was buried as part of the, uh, the culmination of the bicentennial activities um, back in December. And uh, it is, it is located under the, um, lo under or near the, um, the beautiful new statue we have of uh, Minerva there at Manderson Landing. So it is set to open in uh, 50 years from now in um, 2069. And uh, I sincerely hope that I can be there when, um, when we pop that sucker open in 50 years, um, <laughs> being part of the, uh, uh, the initial project. So uh, yes, it was a, a 2019 was a very big year for, uh, for Tuscaloosa and for the state of Alabama. Yeah, I highly recommend if you ever get to Tuscaloosa to go down to Manderson's Landing because the time capsule is sort of at the entrance of the area. And then there's a walkway that tells the story of Tuscaloosa, which I thought mm -hmm. was a really neat idea that has the history uh, and notable things that happened during that time in Tuscaloosa's history. And then it leads up to the statue. It's really beautiful and well done. So I highly recommend people go out to to do that. So um, the well, walkway is uh, the, the, in the shape of the Warrior River as it makes its way through Tuscaloosa, which is, I find, uh, very significant in that the, the river shaped the story of Tuscaloosa itself. Yeah, that's a really, really cool. It's almost like somebody thought about all of these things before they <laughs> built it. <laughs> I think there was one or two committee meetings. <laughs> yeah, very Will, well. actually, uh, Will, were you on the Bicentennial uh, Committee? 
for the I was on and off. I was uh, transitioning between jobs during that time period and a couple of other things going in. So I was I was answering questions and advising and on committees and therefore, yeah. So yeah, overall, yes. Yeah, it's very, very cool. Uh, well, it looks, it looks like we've got some uh, people uh, watching from uh, the international level, uh, not necessarily from the Tuscaloosa uh, area. I mean, I'm sure Tuscaloosa people are watching as well, but uh, it's cool. It's cool that we're talking about some of Tuscaloosa history, but also getting uh, people watching from Greece. Uh, it looks like we're getting people from uh, South Africa and even from Germany. So that's pretty cool that um, even though we're we're here talking a little bit about uh, local Alabama history, that people from around the world are uh, watching and, and learning from you all and, and what we're discussing here. Um, so, uh, Brandon, did you have some questions that you wanted to uh, put out there to everybody about uh, some of the areas of Tuscaloosa? Yeah, absolutely. I have a, we have a few follow-up questions. Some of them are a little more hard-hitting than others. Some of them are a little bit more fun. Uh, <laughs> so we'll start with uh, a little bit more of a serious one, and then we'll, we'll kind of develop and we'll kind of go from there and see what we can do. All right, so what do we think is missing from the historic interpretation in the city? Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, I think we're doing a better job with telling the history of the civil rights um, movement in Tuscaloosa. I think we are drastically lacking on the history of slavery in Tuscaloosa. Uh, the Jemison Mansion and the Battle Freeman House uh, sort of touch on it uh, a little bit. Uh, it's something that I want to delve deeper into in our interpretation in those two uh, structures. Um, but I think uh, that the story and history of slavery is an important aspect of um, our history here, uh, not only Tuscaloosa, but the Southeast uh, as well. Catherine, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I would um, I would agree uh, with uh, with what Will just said. I think um, the other one of the other things that again, we're, we're doing better, um, but it's uh, it's it's a work in progress. Um, there's so much about history that um, that is discovered on a on a very regular basis because there there's always going to be a source that comes up or uh, you know you find something that that slightly changes the story as it has traditionally been told. Um, so I, I think um, you know civil rights is making a, a, a big splash in um, in our local history. Um, I do agree slavery needs to be discussed more um, more regularly, and I think we need to focus on. Um, um, kind of in the same vein as what uh, what Brandon's doing at the Gorgas House, you know, focus on those individuals in our community that haven't been in the limelight. Um, you know, the the women of our community, the um, the the lesser known individuals that helped shape um, town as we as we have come to know it. So I, I think we're I think we're on the right path. Um, there's a there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of uh, research that needs to needs to be done in order to tell these stories and tell them um, tell them well. Yeah, just as an outsider who is uh, not what what you all do in terms of uh, getting that history, um, I think it's cool that it's like ongoing. There's on ongoing research that's happening. I know there's a lot of stuff going on at the Gorgas House Museum, and Catherine, y'all are learning all, all new things all the time at the Transportation Museum. So I think it's cool that it's not you know we're not finished discovering that history. It's an ongoing thing that is uh, still happening. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and just what I would say is like it, it is it's an ongoing conversation, it's an ongoing dialogue, and it's never going to stop. We're always going to be able to fine tune those histories and expand the narratives of what we currently have. Because once again, you know, everyone has something to say and everyone has a right to say something. And as we learn more, we have uh, the obligation, really the responsibility to try and be as open and transparent as in terms of how we're creating the histories we want to talk about and also acknowledging who we are when we make those histories. Um, so yeah, there's there's many, uh, slavery, women, uh, students in town, what their contributions are, what has the architectural history been and how has that changed? What is the Native American history uh, here in, uh, in town and how has that shaped the landscape and how are we continue to shape it? Uh, so. We, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of history we can talk about. It's just finding the time, the spaces, and the resources to do it. But it's it's an as long as the space, as long as spaces like we currently have, like the Transportation Museum, the Gorgas uh, House Museum, as long as we have spaces to talk about this history, we're going to get to it. Uh, but please feel like everybody listening, watching, feels please feel like you have the ability to say something 
in terms of what you think the history should be uh, and how you see would like to see that direction going, please talk to us. And uh, we got a we got a comment here uh, from Stephen that talks about uh, Dr. Green's recent exhibit in the Gorgas House. Um, is that something uh, you can speak to, Brandon? Yeah. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, Dr. Sharon Green of the Department of History at the University of Alabama, her class came by and tour the home uh, about a year and a half ago. And then kind of building off their research was really thinking about how space is utilized and how power dynamics work in different spaces. What she was able to do with some of her take some of the histories of uh, people who are notable Tuscaloosas, Tuscaloosans or people who come through Tuscaloosa and create really a sensory experience to go along with the space. And she spoke about, he did a detailed history on Horace King, who was an enslaved man who went on to be a great engineer uh, in the South and putting many uh, structures and bridges. She talked about Sarah Gale, uh, Amelia's mother, what her contributions were to the city when she lived there. And also Nathaniel Kenyon or Nathaniel King, Nathaniel Kenyon, uh, who was an enslaved, who was a POW, a Union soldier POW, um, who was, uh, I guess, in prison in Tuscaloosa when Tuscaloosa had three POW facilities in town. So it was not only exploring who these people's lives, what their lives were and what their contributions were to the city and to the town itself, but what power looked like for them and the entire room was darkened. There was a video projection with music and she got students involved getting iPad displays uh, and really kind of gave a detailed history on who these people were and what their lives were. And uh, Dr. Green is fantastic. Dr. Sharon Green, look her up, uh, follow some of her work and some of her students work. And it's once again, thinking about space and how can you reimagine what a space can be. So you take a historic space like the Transportation Museum or the Gorgas House Museum and really expand what its contributions can be outside of this single singular historic interpretation and let other people create meaning in the space their own way. And that uh, we were able to do it, Dr. Green was able to do it by talking about the lives of these three notable individuals. And it was a fantastic experience. And uh, Catherine, this comment also says transportation is so interwoven in our lives and history. Is that something that uh, you wanna talk about? Yes, so um, history history is not static. Um, it is it's it's ever evolving, and I think we have a a tendency to think of history in in the black and white, which um, you know the photographs and you know things like that that we have um, due to technology at that time it is black and white. But really, history <laughs> is way more colorful than we um, than we like to. I, you know, we tend to think about it. Um, so I just wanted to just wanted to throw that out there. But yes, transportation is um, is very important. So I mean, the most the most basic form of transportation is walking. And um, you know, if you want to get from if you want to get from one point to the other, if you um, if you don't have a you don't have a dugout canoe, you don't have a horse or a cart or getting more um, advanced, modern, if you don't have a bicycle vehicle, anything like that, the most basic form of, uh, of transportation for humans is walking. And um, so uh, transportation and the way that we have moved through through our history has, um, has really, really impacted um, everything about um about how we are and i'm using the current uh current you know global um pandemic as an example um you know the this uh virus that we're we're all um trying to avoid um and by working from home and practicing social distancing um it travels too and um that's that is transportation um as a as a theme is definitely something that impacts us on a, a daily and uh, I would say hourly basis, whether we realize it or not. And uh, it, it is it is very interwoven into everything we do. Uh, we also have a question uh, that says there used to be a 3D display of pre-war campus in the library. Is that still on campus somewhere? Does anyone know about that display? I do yeah, remember I that display. I don't know. I, I, I know the display. Uh, yeah. I know they've been doing a lot of work in terms of renovations inside the library pretty recently, so I don't know if it's still there. It could have been moved to special collections temporarily due to the renovations, would be my best guess. 
It, yeah, I, I would agree with that. It's it, if it's not currently on display with all the renovations happening in uh, in the library, hopefully it will be back on display once those renovations are complete. Because it, it is a stunning it is a stunning display of what campus looked like um, pre um, pre civil pre civil war. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Yeah, because both uh, the Gorgas House Museum and the Transportation Museum uh, talk about the Civil War aspects of the the, the local history and how those impacted uh, the city of Tuscaloosa and the University of Alabama. So it is uh, an important thing to put on display. Uh, let's see, uh, Dr. Bomar says, I believe there were models created for planning the large painting done by artist Dean Mosher. Okay. Okay. And uh, it looks like we also uh, might have somebody from Washington, D.C. Stuart, uh, yep, yep, Stuart's left us some questions. Yep, that's right. So mm -hmm. Executive Director of the White House Historical Association. So uh, thank you for watching and uh, adding a, a comment about our content. Uh, so we're glad you're enjoying it. Uh, so, uh, Brandon, do you have any questions about uh, local establishments or lo local landmarks around town? Uh, yes, I do. Um and this is one of my favorite questions we had, just in case we could get to it. So I'm curious to see what everybody has to say. So does anybody, does anyone have their favorite local landmarks and why? And Catherine, we'll, we'll start with you. Well, um, as we as we kind of discussed in our little uh, pre-meeting uh, before we went live, I my favorite landmarks change on a daily basis. Um, there are so many, there are so many great locations around town. It's really, really hard to pick just one. Um, you know, for example, the Battle Freeman House, uh, you can't beat the Battle Freeman House in the springtime just because the gardens are all in bloom and it's, 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 it's a lovely little bubble um, away from the, you know, the, the stresses of modern life. Um, but, you know, with the right, um, background of the sky, the Jemison Mansion and the architecture of that building is absolutely stunning. Um, but I, for, for the sake of the question, um, I would say my favorite local landmark is uh, Capitol Park and um, that uh, it it's such an interesting location. It's got the the ruins and the slight uh, reconstruction in order to give a sense of scale of what the Capitol building uh, that stood there once upon a time looked like. Um, but it's also where um, my husband proposed. So um, it carries a, oh, okay. it carries oh, a special that's, place. That's there. an acceptable um, answer. It, yeah. it, carries, yeah. it carries a special place in my heart historically and personally. So. Um, <laughs> But um, but yes, but any any given day, I could have a different answer. But uh, I'll I'll stick with I'll stick with Capitol Park for uh, for this uh, this particular conversation. That's a good answer. That's pretty fair. Um, uh, Will, what about you? Yeah. So um, I've I've been contemplating this question, um, and much like Catherine, it depends uh, a lot on what type of mood I'm in, uh, what I'm reading, uh, and what's going on. Uh, so right now, my, my favorite landmark um, is, is the river uh, in Manderson Landing. That's where I love to go and run, uh, and it's beautiful in the springtime. Uh, it's been uh, interesting watching the water levels go up and down lately. Um, but outside of um, the riverfront, um, I would probably have to go uh, with uh, the very top of the Jemison Mansion, where a lot of people don't have access to, but going up there... Uh, at the end of a, a day, a uh, stressful day, and uh, the sun is setting beautifully. There's not a better uh, place to take in a sunset than I think of at the top of the Jemison Mansion. So um, those would be my top two places besides being at home with my, with my wife and kids. The uh, top of the Jemison Mansion is also a great location to watch a nice thunderstorm roll in. Yes. That's a pretty good location. Yes. Be careful of the lightning. Uh, yes. If there's any, <laughs> but it, it is a great location. It is grounded. It is grounded. So, yes. Uh, but that, that's a great location to watch a, a good thunderstorm roll in, too. I'll have to remember that. Yeah. Those are all good uh, examples uh, because I'm um, just, I'm okay, just, so, yeah. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm just sort of rediscovering uh, Tuscaloosa since my college experience. So a lot has changed since I graduated in 2003. Uh, so uh, I'm now kind of getting back into learning more about Tuscaloosa. And so I've, all the, the places that you're talking about, I want to go and venture out and uh, discover them for myself because those, those were landmarks I had not uh, seen while I was in school there. So I, I, I'm enjoying hearing your answers. So it gives me some places to go and visit. Well, Brandon, what's your favorite local landmark? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll try 
Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'll try and answer it. Uh, Dr. Bowmore had a good uh, good question in the comment section. He's just saying he would love to hear some of our viewers' favorite landmarks in Tuscaloosa. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so I love to read what everybody has to say. Um, but when I was thinking about this question, and the first one that came to mind uh, is the original Dreamland Barbecue. I knew you were Yeah, it, it's historic. It was built in 1958. Uh, it is getting a little close to lunch, so it sounds really good right now. Um, but yeah, just have a lot of memories there. And you know, it's a food history, and food history is a big thing. Um, and that's a, definitely a Tuscaloosa landmark when you start thinking about Tuscaloosa. All you have to do is turn into ESPN every Saturday in the fall. You can definitely hear about that too. Um, but <laughs> I also like to bring it up whenever we have uh, a tour of the museum because we, I can kind of connect it to the Gorgas house. Um, so to get to Dreamland Barbecue, the original one anyway, you have to go up Jug Factory Road uh, to get there. And that's named for Daniel Cribbs, Daniel Cribbs, a local potter who had a kiln there. Oh, shoot. Uh, Kathy might be able to answer this more than I do, at least in the mid 19th century, I think 1830, 1828, yeah. something like that, when he first came there. Yes. And we had these ceramic discs in the Gorgas house called ant cups. And the way they worked is you'd put the center of your pantry or your pie safe, which is a whole different discussion, uh, on the middle of it. And you fill that apart with water and it would keep ants from crawling up and getting to it. And ant cups are found in artifact assemblages from historic excavations and house sites. They're made of coarse earthenware, which is basically just utilitarian pottery. And they're made locally. So there's a pretty good chance that the ones we have in the Gorgas house, which date back to that time period, probably or could have been made by Daniel Cribbs and the slaves he had working there. Uh, so I think it's an interesting way to tie the local community together uh, and kind of tie it in with local food history too. Uh, so I try and do that whenever I get a chance to do it. Um, so yeah, Dreamland Barbecue, that's my definitive answer. <laughs> Uh, Steven says uh, the former former L and N Railroad uh, passenger depot. Uh, do y'all have any thoughts about that? Another great location. Yeah, another, another great location. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a beautiful that, building. That building is uh, not only yeah, yes, it is beautiful, but it's it's seen a lot of different uh, types of usage in that building. Uh, so yeah, that's that's it. That's a really good choice. That is a good one. And. Uh, Dr. Bomar talks about uh, Malville Archaeological Park and the uh, historic railroad trestle. Uh, so uh, that those are good suggestions too. And let's see, uh, let's see. Doug says the doorway at Foster Auditorium that is considered a landmark. Uh, his, the yeah. historical yeah. significance yeah. is very important there. Mm -hmm. There's probably uh, a million yeah, of things that we haven't thought of. We're all going, oh yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great one. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, the, it, the it, railroad it, trestle was really neat um, because. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Oh go ahead. no, I, I was just going to say if, if we were talking restaurants, um, I don't know is City Cafe a, a considered a Tuscaloosa landmark or is that more Northport? Uh, that's Northport. It's in historic downtown Northport, so that okay. is, that is legit Northport. Yeah. Okay. It All is right. Tuscaloosa it, County, it, so it, it's. Oh, I would, okay. I would, okay. Yeah, I would accept that as an answer because yes. that may be the best meet and greet of all. Of yeah, them. I don't think you'll. I don't, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think you'll find any Tuscaloosa person disowning City Cafe. No, no. not at not at all. No. Not okay. At all. all right. <laughs> uh, sorry, Brandon. I, I think I might have interrupted you. So, what were you going to say? Oh shoot. Uh, I was just trying to tie in another Gorgas connection to um, Dr. Bob Moore's historic railroad trestle. Uh, Colonel Hardaway, Hardaway Hall is named after him on campus. He was the engineer, uh, civil engineer and the architect who helped redesign the front portico in the Gorgas house. Uh, but his son was the one who designed that railroad trestle. And his descendants still have an engineering and architectural firm in Columbus, Georgia, I think. Uh, so th there's a way of connecting everybody back uh, to our historic spaces. Uh, well, we have about uh, seven more minutes. So are there any other uh, questions that, uh, Brandon, do you have any other questions that you want to pose or anybody else in the uh, comment section if you have any questions? Uh, I've got a couple. I know we need to talk about kind of like the current projects we're working on. Oh, uh, yeah, we, we can, can touch definitely on that real them. quick. Um, and if we finish that, I have one more question we can, we can get to. All right, so our current projects. Uh, uh, Catherine, we'll start with you again. 
Right. So, um, so we are working on uh, several, several things. Of course, we're doing it remotely now, but um, the, we have several exhibits planned uh, throughout the year that range from contemporary Native American art to um, Arctic exploration with uh, Bama bugs uh, tucked right in the middle. <laughs> and um we're, uh, you know, we're, we're working to uh, develop, uh, you know, of course, more online content and making sure that we are uh, putting out information in, uh, in that capacity. Um, but, um, but yeah, we're, we're working on uh, several exhibits that we are very excited to, uh, to showcase throughout the, throughout the year. And uh, we look forward to the day in the uh, hopeful near future uh, where we can share all of these wonderful projects with the community and, um, uh, in, in our location and, uh, get, you know, have the ability to move around again a little bit more, but, um, but yes, we have, we have a lot that's, uh, that's planned and, um, hopefully we will be able to put all of it into practice very, very soon. That sounds um, great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Will, do you have anything uh, that you would like to talk about? Well, with, uh, five historic buildings, um, our current project is keeping five historic buildings standing up. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Been there, done that. Yes, yeah. I, I understand. <laughs> Fundraising, uh, since we're a 501c3. Uh, but outside of that, um, due to the, uh, our current uh, COVID-19 and the, the pandemic that's going on, uh, we are rearranging uh, fundraising events, trying to get those come back later in the year. Uh, then outside of that, I'm wanting to uh, start to digitize our archives that we have at the Preservation Society, um, simply so we not only have a paper copy, but we can have a digital copy forever, hopefully, um, for, for the end of time. So, uh, and then uh, I do want to start uh, doing an in-depth exhibition on slavery and the slaves that served uh, inside the Jemison Vandergraaf Mansion and the Battle of Freeman House and Gardens, because uh, I think those are important stories to tell. And what about you, Brandon? Uh, what's going on at the Gorgas House Museum? Uh, sorry, there's a little bit of lag. You're asking me? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, great. In terms of the uh, and some of the future projects currently working on uh, an exhibit uh, based on the confederados uh, with a uh, um, professor on campus and also a former student who now works at the library and they were a group of southerners who left the south to go uh, really reestablish themselves in brazil uh, after and during the civil war you know what does that history look like because we have some notable tuscaloosans who are involved in that project uh, looking at digitizing and really changing our artifact curation, curation database from an older file maker database to this ArcTOS database, which is a fantastic program that'll make everything accessible for the public. Uh, so ArcTOS, look that one up. Um, a lot of student projects. We just finished translating our docent manual and our tour guides into Arabic. Um, so people can look and kind of uh, reach out to a larger international audience. Uh, so those are the three big ones that come to mind right now. And whenever we get back on campus, have some architectural things we'll work on, like redoing the walkway out front and whatnot. Uh, but it's really trying to change access and now creating more online and media content for people to still, you know, come by and get as much history as they can. So those are the first ones that come to mind. Well, well, that is awesome. Well, we're we're nearing an hour. Are there any last minute things that uh, you would like to say to people uh, before we uh, sign off here? Um, the Preservation Society's website uh, now has three online tours that sh uh, kids can take advantage of uh, while they're at home. Uh, there's one for the Old Tavern, the Battle of Freedman, and the Jemison Mansion. Uh, simply go to uh, historictuscaloosa.org, uh, click on the Properties tab, and you'll see it drop down there. Uh, you can either read it online or print it out. It's in PDF form. Uh, and it's got uh, some questions at the end if parents want to have their students uh, read through it uh, for a little social studies project while they're at home. And those went up earlier this week, so they're brand new. Awesome. Well, I think that's probably going to do it for this edition of Museums from Your Home with this Facebook live stream. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody, we're going to be doing this every weekday, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. every day. And each day we will feature a different museum or aspect of museum work. Uh, tomorrow, we're actually going to be learning about archaeology. So come back and join us for that. And for a, let's see, I'll 
uh, pull up our, our fun little ticker here just in case uh, people want to read it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if you want a full live stream schedule and links to our Color Our Collections coloring book, if you have some little ones at home or if you are a uh, an adult who likes coloring, and that's perfectly fine too. They have adult coloring books now. Uh, it's a great way to actually relax and uh, just uh, have some uh, peaceful time. So you can check out uh, our Color Collections coloring book and Discovering Alabama's online educational resources, including free episodes and teacher guides. You can go to museums.ua.edu slash museums from your home. And uh, thanks everybody for visiting UA Museums from your home. I have a quick shout out. I've got two birthdays today. <laughs> okay. Excuse me. I'm sorry. That's all right. I want to wish my dad, my dad, a happy birthday. And uh, my good friend, Mary from graduate school. Happy birthday, you guys. All right. Well, we'll end on a, on a happy positive note there with uh, some shout outs. And uh, I hope everybody has a great day. Thank y'all. Thank Thanks, everybody. You.